Hello and welcome back to Where's the Bandwagon. My name is Will and this is part three of my breakdown of Rose. If you haven't seen part one or part two, you can click the card on the top right hand side of the screen. Otherwise, let's just jump right back into it. When Rose returns, Mickey is obviously a plastic man and a lot of people wonder why she can't tell he's an Orton. Here, the clear visual changes between Mickey and Orton Mickey are for the audience's benefit. In Spearhead from Space, the classic Doctor Who story mentioned earlier, it was made clear that people in the show have a hard time distinguishing real people from Ortons. This is also indicated earlier in this episode when the Doctor says this. You're not plastic, mate. No. Bonehead. Showing that even the Doctor can't visually tell the difference. Rose and Mickey go out for dinner and Rose is talking about possible job options. Suki said they had jobs going in the canteen. Is that it then? Dishing out chips? She would eventually try her hand at serving chips in school reunion. Rose says... It's all Jimmy Stones' fault. I left school because of him, look where he ended up. Rather bizarrely, Russell T Davies massively expands on this character, Jimmy Stone, in the novelization of Rose. Story time. Rose dumped Mickey when she was 16 to run off with Jimmy Stone. Jimmy Stone then ran off and stole Rose's computer, this being the reason why she needs to borrow Mickey's earlier in the episode. Rose gets back with Mickey after she found out that he remained faithful after she ran off with this other man. Does that sound familiar? In the book, it is noted that during the 2005 Alton invasion, Jimmy Stone was robbing his current girlfriend when he was killed and chopped up by Altons, who are much more violent in the book adaptation. What well, goes around comes around, Jimmy. Alton Mickey tries to change the subject to talk about the Doctor. Oh, I'm sorry, was I talking about me for a second? Because I reckon it all started back at the shop, am I right? This reminded me that his view will change throughout the rest of Rose's time with the Doctor, as she starts to constantly talk about the Doctor and their adventures, with Mickey wanting to talk about anything else. Just let every Christmas. Can you do that? Just for a bit. The Doctor arrives to save Rose, and they go out to the TARDIS, during which the Doctor name drops the sonic screwdriver. When the Doctor first walks into the TARDIS, the background behind him is black. This is the same as how the classic series used to look. However, this is done just to not give any indication about what's inside to new viewers who don't know what awaits them. I love that Rose understandably tries everything before going into this small box, and when she does we get this wonderful close-up shot of her reaction. Initially, Russell T Davis wanted the viewer to share in Rose's view of seeing inside the TARDIS for the first time. However, the director at the time changed it. I personally think it works so much better. Russell T Davis also remarked that he wanted us to follow Rose into the TARDIS all in one shot, but it was not feasible on his budget. This effect would later be accomplished in 2012's The Snowman and later in Day of the Doctor. As she enters, you can also hear the Doomsday music. This is the same music that would famously be played when Rose becomes trapped in a parallel Earth. The Doctor says, The assembled odds of Genghis Khan could get through that door, and believe me, they've tried. And there are many accounts in external novels and audio dramas where the Doctor encounters Genghis Khan. However, the most comparable with this is the sixth Doctor audio drama, City of Spires, where it's mentioned that the TARDIS withstood an attack from the hordes of Genghis Khan. This line, spoken by the Doctor, can also be heard in Matt Smith's episode, Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS. Rose says, The inside's bigger than the outside? Yes. Which is no, it's bigger on the inside, but it will do. In the incredible finale of Day of the Doctor, clips from multiple Eccleston episodes, including from Rose, would be used. The Doctor thinks Rose is crying due to a culture shock, however, he doesn't understand it's because she thinks her boyfriend is dead. Did, did they kill Mickey? Is he dead? Oh, I didn't think of that. The coldness and logical reasoning of the Doctor would be explored further throughout the run of the show. Look, if I did forget some kid called Mickey... Yeah, he's not a kid! ...because I'm busy trying to save the life of every stupid ape blundering about on top of this planet, all right! And the amount would change from Doctor to Doctor. Do you know, in 900 years of time and space, I've never met anyone who wasn't important before. The gods. Oh. Oh, right, you are. Uh... This cold logical reasoning can be tracked back to the very first story of the show, as William Hartnell shows cold logical reasoning to save himself and his new companions. Rose questions... If you are an alien, how come you sound like you're from the North? Lots of planets have a North. A similar statement to this is made in the very first episode in 1963, when Barbara says... You are one of us. You look like us. You sound like us. The reference to the Doctor having a Northern accent relates to the media attention generated around Christopher Eccleston, who had always retained his native Lancashire accent not conforming to people's perception of what the Doctor should be like. He also references the fact that different actors who had previously played the Doctor had themselves differing accents, most notably Sylvester McCoy, whose Doctor spoke with a light Scottish accent, which would crop up again when Peter Capaldi took the role. Hi, but I think he knows it's about disguise. Exactly, that's what it's kind of like. It's kind of it's a disguise. Yeah. yeah, but it's, that's what we're exactly. saying, like trying to justify yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So if you can, like, wind me up about it, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll fight the corner. Well, what's a police public call box? 
a telephone box from the 19th. It's a disguise. Okay. The Doctor explains that the Earth is the perfect planet for the nesting consciousness. This is one of many political statements Doctor Who has made over its tenure, although this reference is made in a subtle way that doesn't pull you out of the story. The Doctor explains that its food stock was destroyed in the war, all its protein planets rotted, so Earth dinner. Hinting towards future conversations with the nesting consciousness about the time war. We later learn that the Doctor fought in the war, but not much else is told to us until future episodes. The Doctor and Rose run towards the London Eye and grab hands. Russell T Davies wanted to show the hand holding to signify that they were a team, so that they were not questioning their relationship. Fantastic. Russell said I'd really like them to hold hands on the bridge and grab, grab each, you know, grab each other. And at that moment, there is a kind of bonding. They're in it together. He's not, he's not said to her, come with me, or he's not trying to look after her anything. She's just part of the team. The production team also took great effort to capture them running with London buses behind them. Right. Time the action, so a couple of buses went past. There's not a bus inside, look. Yes. I'm sick of red London buses. Kept getting in the back of my shop. The doctor explains what will happen if the invasion begins. When researching, I found an incredible thread of people discussing why, then, when we do see the invasion, that not all the plastic things on screen come to life. I'll just read it out. Someone started the thread by asking, The Doctor says everything plastic shall come to life. However, during the autumn invasion, you could see heaps of plastic items that stay dormant. In fact, it's only the shop window dummies that come to life. You can see shopping bags, chairs, bins that don't come to life at all. <laughs> the first reply, he means the plastic that is controlled by the nesting. Why would the nesting make plastic bags come to life when you have a whole army of shot dummies? Someone replied saying the plastic bags could fly around and suffocate people. <laughs> to which they replied, considering the way Orton Mickey was blundering about, unable to see when the doctor pulled his head off, the plastic bags might have trouble finding their targets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Rose finds the hatch down to the Orton's lair. This is after she pointed out the London Eye to the Doctor. This shows that she is again helping rather than hindering the Doctor on his adventure. Another key point as to his decision to invite her to join him. The sequences in this lair were originally meant to be much longer, involving another Orton Mickey. However, they had to be cut due to health and safety concerns of the location, which was an unused paper mill in Cardiff. The location had to be steam cleaned before filming could even commence. We see the nesting consciousness. One of the most important and overlooked lines in the episode comes when they first enter the room. I'm not here to kill it. I've got to give it a chance. It's important because it lets the audience know that he doesn't want to be a straight up killer and that everything deserves a chance. This makes his actions in Dalek all the more shocking to the viewer as the Doctor immediately wants to kill the Dalek, further improving the feeling of the Dalek being evil and how much the Doctor just hates it. We also later learn that this Doctor thinks he's just killed his entire race, including 2.47 billion children, so would want to keep his death toll as low as possible as he already has a guilty conscience. This also makes Eccleston's defining moment as the Doctor all the more meaningful. Everybody lives, Rose. Just this once! Everybody lives! Nicholas Briggs makes his debut in the revived series as the voice of the nesting consciousness. He would become the show's designated voice actor, primarily voicing the Daleks and the Cybermen. Briggs is an active member of Doctor Who unofficial and licensed spin-offs and audio dramas. He would make his first on-screen appearance in Torchwood Children of Earth. The Doctor makes a statement in order to approach the nesting consciousness. This is the same kind of speech Rose would attempt in The Christmas Invasion. Both speeches mention the Shadow Proclamation. We would hear this mentioned throughout seasons 1-4 to four until the Doctor and Donna would visit in the Stolen Earth. The Doctor talks to the nesting consciousness and, when he's interrupted, says I am talking! This same statement would again be used in the famous Pandorica speech. The Doctor goes on to try and convince the nesting consciousness not to invade Earth by explaining just how early the human race is in its development. And this is expanded upon a lot in the show. Key examples of this include when we learn of the first steps towards the stars in the waters of Mars, when we visit humans in the future such as at New New York and in Oudsphere, and the crew in the Impossible Planet. Usually the Doctor explains that humans head out towards the stars and So many species, so little time. What? Well, that's what we do when we get out there. That's our mission. We seek new life and Dance. And in The Power of Three, the villain the Shakri, believed to be the pest controllers of the universe, come to try and wipe out the human race before it spreads. Here you can accidentally see the microphone of a crew member above the Doctor's head. 
there are plenty of other bloopers and errors which I found in each Doctor Who episode. However, I want to keep most of them out since once you see these errors, it's really hard to unsee them and it might degrade your viewing experiences if I share them with you. However, if enough people want to see them, I can do a list of them in a separate video. My favourite reference in the whole of the episode comes when the Nestian consciousness identifies the TARDIS. The Doctor says that it has become terrified once it sees it. What's it doing? It's the TARDIS! The Nestine's identified it as superior technology. It's terrified. It's going to the final base. We know the Nestine consciousness has just escaped the time war and that it somewhat blames the Doctor. That's not true. I should know. I was there. I fought in the war. It wasn't my fault. I couldn't save your world. I couldn't save any of them. This reminds me of the mid-episode before the day of the Doctor called The Night of the Doctor, where Paul McGann reprises his role. In it, the Doctor tries to save a lady from crash landing, but she recognises the TARDIS and becomes scared of the Time Lord, eventually wanting to kill him. Is this a TARDIS? Yes, but you'll be perfectly safe, I promise you. Don't touch me! I'm not part of the war. I swear to you, I never was. You were a Time Lord. Yes, I'm a Time Lord, but I'm one of the nice ones. Get away from me! Here in Rose, the nesting consciousness recognises the ship and becomes terrified, mirroring the actions of the minisode. Rose calls her mum and tells her to go home. The mum doesn't listen and Rose repays the favour when they speak again after the invasion. While Clive is happily chatting away about spreadsheets, the invasion begins. 10 out of 10 for observation. Russell T. Davis wanted to recreate the scene of the Ortons breaking out of the shop windows from their first appearance in Spearhead from Space, although he actually had the budget to actually smash the glass instead of just cutting around it like in Spearhead. Clive realises that he's right and that all of his conspiracies are true. However, it turns out that the old saying But be careful what you wish for applied and he's killed in cold blood in front of his family. In the Rose novelization, Russell T. Davis gives Clive a slightly more noble death by having him sacrifice himself while deliberately slowing down the Ortons so his family could escape. But every time I see his death, it really breaks my heart and it's designed to really shock the audience. In the short story, The Persistence of Memory, the 12th Doctor finds a young Clive in 1979 and takes him on an adventure in space and time. This image shown here is Clive looking out at the Loch Ness Monster. In the end of the story, the Doctor wipes his memory of the trip, but Clive finds his notebook of the adventure that would spark his obsession that we see in Rose. The Orton invasion is referenced in Love and Monsters. Window dummies, come to life. The nesting consciousness says the word Time Lord. Many people online swear he's saying Bad Wolf, but I don't really get how they've heard that, and iPlayer doesn't have subtitles for this particular moment. Speaking of Bad Wolf, when researching these episodes, I've found tons of other Bad Wolf messages and references pointed out to me that I didn't know was there. But I can't find any Bad Wolf message in this episode. However, there are tons and tons of posters and graffiti in this episode, so maybe there is a Bad Wolf message that just hasn't been found yet. In the animated reconstruction of the second Doctor episode, The Invasion, Bad Wolf can be seen written on the wall. This is a phenomenal inclusion from the animators. I'll almost certainly be doing an every Bad Wolf reference ever video, so please subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when that happens. Rose uses her gymnastic skills to save the Doctor and save the Earth. However, this is not, to my recollection, ever mentioned or utilised again. The Doctor catches Rose, much like he will fail to do in The Runaway Bride. Oh, sorry. Thanks for nothing. And they make their escape, with Mickey clinging on to the side of the TARDIS, much like Captain Jack will do in Utopia. Several shots of the exploding Nestine lair were reused in Age of Steel with the destruction of Battersea Power Station. The Doctor invites Rose to come with him, explicitly saying Mickey is not invited. He's not invited. This view of Mickey would change in the upcoming episode World War 3, where Mickey's heroics earn the Doctor's respect. You could look after her. Come with us. Mickey would eventually join the TARDIS crew following the events of School Reunion. Mickey clings to Rose, much like he does in Father's Day, which reminds Rose that she has a life here that she can't just abandon. This could be a reason why the introduction of time travel changes her mind, as she thinks that with time travel she can go travelling but come back and help Mickey and her mum out as if she never left. Yeah, because that turned out well. Even before the Doctor leaves, you can see the look of regret on Rose's face. She immediately knows it was a bad decision not to take him up on the offer. This is much like Donna Noble when she regrets turning down the offer in The Runaway Bride. Must be mad, turning down that offer. What offer? To 
come with you. The TARDIS dematerializes and materializes in all its glory, and the Doctor finishes this conversation by saying, Did I mention it also travels in time? Rose changes her mind. It could be that as soon as he left, she realized how much she regretted her decision, so as soon as he came back, she always knew she was going to say yes. Or the time traveling aspect could have been the game changer. This is expanded on further in Father's Day when the Doctor says, When we met, I said, Travel with me in space. You said no. Then I said, Time machine. Many people theorise that the Doctor went on some adventures between the TARDIS leaving and coming back again, some theorising that this is when he visits the Titanic, Krakatoa and the Kennedy assassination. We do know, depending on what you class as canon, from the book The Beast of Babylon that the Doctor did go on at least one adventure before he came back to tell her that the TARDIS can also travel in time. We get the sweeping logo and a next time trailer that would be a regular feature in the series to come. Eccleston is credited here as Doctor Who instead of The Doctor. When David Tennant was cast, it was reverted back to The Doctor on David Tennant's request. There are so, so many things I didn't manage to fit into this because it was getting too damn long, but hopefully I didn't miss anything too important. Thanks for watching. Blimey, this took a long time. Please subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell if you want to be notified when I break down the end of the world. I'm also doing this and reacting to the classic series of Doctor Who, so you can check that out. This is the channel of me and my friend Ty where we talk movies and sports and games and pop culture. There will be a ton of Doctor Who stuff coming up, but why don't you check out some of our other topics and see if there's anything else you like. See you later. Do you know like we were saying about the Earth revolving? It's like when you're a kid. The first time they tell you that the world's turning and you just can't quite believe it because everything looks like it's standing still. I can feel it. The turn of the earth. The ground beneath our feet is spinning at a thousand miles an hour, and the entire planet is hurtling around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour, and I can feel it. We're falling through space, you and me, clinging to the skin of this tiny little world, and if we let go,